the, um, this is an opportunity. Um, probably you can introduce yourself and you'll soon find out why he is our bodhisattva. So over to you. Morning, everyone. Can you do? I need to stand closer to the mic for you to hear me in the back row. Can you hear me clearly? Good. Then I'll be as relaxed as you are. Um, if you can kindly admit that person. Say again. Uh, there's a this button called admit. If you can kindly oh, admit. Oh, sure, sure. Um, we can. Okay, okay that's I'm easy. Yeah. That's all. That's all. Is everybody admitted? Yeah. So uh, we have a number of people also joining us. More, I can do it. I, can, I know how to admit people. I'm good at it. <laughs> so I'll keep my eyes open. So then I must welcome also everyone who's joining us online, taking full advantage of modern, modern, lovely technology uh, that enables us all to be here today. It would have been a very, very long swim from Santa Barbara to Christchurch. I wouldn't have made it. So I'm... I want to start with gratitude for technology and everything that's made us possible for us coming from so many places around the world today. To address a topic that's very dear to my heart, and I think the topic itself, I think, is important for everyone on the planet. I read just a couple of days ago that our population is now up to 8 billion. I'm not whether, sure whether we should throw a party or not. <laughs> But our world is ailing, our world, our ecosphere, our home is wounded. And we know who has wounded it. It is us. We don't need to point the finger in any direction. It is I and all the rest of it. Wounded, ailing, ill in so many ways. And I don't need to elaborate because I think we're all vividly aware of the unprecedented times we're living in right now as human species where the population has tripled since I was born. At least I've not contributed to that, but tripled in just 72 years. And so the world needs healing and it needs it very, very fast. It's never in the in recorded history of humanity have we ever faced such a multitude of crises that actually can utterly undermine our way of life, modern civilization. And so I, I know of someone I've been hearing about a young lady who's 14 years old. And I thought, my goodness, she may very well see us to the end of this century, in the year 2300. And what will this world look like in the year 2300? And if we follow the trajectory on right now, well, to put it lightly, it will not be a pretty picture. We cannot continue on the trajectory we are right now. And we can't fix it with band-aids and scotch tape. We can't fix it with a little technique here and a bit more electric cars there. Not when we've wiped out 69% of the wildlife on the planet since 1970. We're approaching very quickly the amount of destruction the asteroid did 64, years, 64 million years ago. So these are times of unprecedented crisis. And the roots of the crisis that we have created for ourselves, for other species, and for the ecosphere as, as a whole, the roots are very deep. And they really do come out of Europe. Eurocentric countries like New Zealand, Australia, United States, and a very big, large, and so on. The world is in need of very deep healing and no first aid will do it. So I'm introducing into this, in the title here, the term contemplative science. I think I was the first one to write it down when I was doing my undergraduate work many, many years ago. It is the very term itself, contemplative science. It sounds like yes and no and left and right, two things that would be by and large diametrically opposed to each other. If contemplation, the contemplative life, is quintessentially religious and science to a large extent since the, since the mid 19th century, the, the era of Darwin, has been almost defining itself as a response to and a rebuttal of religion we've seen a great rift arise, and I think no more flagrantly than in Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, of modern academia and so forth, saying, religion, we've been there, we've done that. 
and now we need to move on. Well, we have moved on, but where are we going? Let's see if I can, okay. The arrows are not working. Arindam to the rescue. I'm pushing the arrows that I would have on my computer and not working. No? Okay, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Save the day. A little bit about me and very little because I'm just here for a short time and then I'll be no longer on this planet. But while I'm still here, I'd like to do as much good as I can. Meaning of life, isn't it? When I was 20, having been really very much acculturated into Western European civilization, born in America, but also in Scotland and in Switzerland, and a little bit in Israel as well. So I had a wonderfully rich childhood and adolescence. Went back as an adolescent at my first year of high school or secondary school in Switzerland. When I was 20, went to Germany, entered the university there. So I feel very much at home as a European, a Eurocentric individual. So I have to own it if I'm going to make some critical comments about Eurocentric civilization. I'm the target. <laughs> <laughs> but I left Western civilization at the age of 21 with a sense that there was nothing I wanted here. Just nothing I wanted here. I'd had a very good education, loving parents. I mean, look at my background, my childhood, adolescence. They well, what are you unhappy about, young man? And I said, it was just that they had no taste. There was nothing I wanted. And what I wanted, I couldn't see anywhere that I could fulfill my inner yearning. And I was willing to really sacrifice anything to see and look into the possibility of a filling aspiration that I has never been able to even begin fulfilling. So I bought myself at the age of 21, a one-way ticket to India to go to, the, to, to live with the Tibetans home of the Dalai Lama, without enough money for a return ticket. So I wasn't burning bridges. There weren't any bridges to burn. I was on my way. And that's defined my life ever since then. And it was maybe the best choice I ever made to seek out the Dalai Lama. And just within months of my arrival in Dharamsala, met with him, knew that I had a connection, and I knew that I'd found my spiritual guide, and he has been ever since. But after 14 years of a hiatus, taking a break, like timeout in, in basketball, I need a timeout, timeout from Western civilization. It's not speaking to my heart, it's not providing me with a sense of truth and meaning at the same time. Religion provides meaning. Anybody who's religious knows that. Science provides facts, knowledge, understanding. Anybody who knows science knows that is true. Religion has been on the defensive for quite a few years by now. Do you really stand for truth or do you just have a lot of good stories, very meaningful and lovely stories? And science has been on the rise ever since Galileo and then especially from, Dar from Darwin and so on in the mid 19th century. Science has been on the rise and it said sometimes that we've learned more in the 20th century about the nature of the universe than in all of the centuries preceding. I think it may very well be true. The exponential growth of knowledge in the 20th century in all fields except one, extraordinary, really extraordinary. In terms of the acquisition, the growth, the burgeoning of our knowledge as a human species was an absolute extraordinary, unprecedented century to celebrate. And yet the worst, the bloodiest wars that we've ever waged upon each other, 20 million in the First World War, 80 million in the Second World War, and how many wars since then? that continue on as if we've learned nothing from all of our mistakes in the past. The most violent desecration of the environment ever in recorded history. How could we know so much and do so much evil? And that is our question. That we can't look, I think, to the source of the problems as a source of the answers. So the world, if we look at I, my professional academic training is in religious studies, comparative religion, with a lot of philosophy, a fair amount of psychology, gives me some background in religious studies. We actually had a religious studies department at Stanford. Very useful. 
So I have some appreciation, I think, of the history of the great contemplative traditions of the world, all of which are embedded and have their roots in the great religious traditions, the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all, each one of them individually, has a tremendously rich contemplative heritage. And it's not just devotion and worship and prayer and obedience and faith and submission. All of those are very meaningful terms, actually in all contemplative tradition. But it's not that. It's not just that. And likewise, Hinduism, the multiple branches of the Vedic tradition, and then there's the Jaina and the Sikh and the Zoroastrian and so on, Chinese Buddhism, all branches of Buddhism and Taoism. So from all of these great six right there, three to the west, three to the east, each one of them holds jewels, jewels, treasures of not only religious pious, and I use that word with respect, pious, reverent, devout worship in the contemplative life. All of them have that. But something that we've largely lost sight of in this 20th and 21st century is that the great contemplative traditions also, each of them individually, and in varying ways, some to an intense degree, some to a lesser degree, each one of these great contemplative traditions included also elements of inquiry. All of these contemplative traditions primarily, without exception, all of them primarily were seeking to know the nature of reality by looking inwards. Looking inwards upon the soul, looking inwards upon the divine, the Atman, the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of heaven within, the Buddha nature, the Atman, but overwhelmingly east and west, the great contemplatives would temporarily withdraw from the world, like breathing in, and seek to know the truth that will make us free. And many did find. But with the rise of European colonialism from the 16th century, the conquest by European nations, many of them, of really the rest of the world, the Americas, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, much of Asia. European civilization back then from the 17th century on, the 16th century on, went very, very large into exhalation, looking outwards, extending outwards, expanding empires, spreading our culture, spreading our religion, spreading our wings to dominate the earth with very few countries escaping our net. With this great breathing outwards, this great looking outwards, this extroversion, extroception, looking outwards, as science from the time of Galileo and then building crescendo, crescendo, crescendo with Newton and then on to the 20th and 21st century, we've learned so much about the external world without which, without that knowledge, without the accompanying technology, we wouldn't be here. I might send you a letter. Remember how long that took when people still sent letters? <laughs> so it's been on the one hand, an extraordinary success story of Eurocentric domination of the planet and spreading our culture. Here we are in New Zealand, in Christchurch, a very European university, but the National University of Singapore, the University of Hong Kong, and on and on and on in Sao Paulo and so forth. We find European universities in communist China. We find them in Brazil. We find them everywhere. The education, modern education, the National Institute of Mental Health and Neuroscience in India, the IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. They're all European based. This is all European education. That's what we have. Modern education is Euro European education. And it's all looking outwards. As the Dalai Lama has often commented, modern education is looking outwards to help us make a living, to succeed, to acquire wealth, power, influence, status. It's all about what the Greeks called hedonia. Hedonia, not something vulgar or crude. There's nothing crude or vulgar about modern education. But it's looking outwards to the kind of happiness that we can pursue and acquire from the world by getting a good education, getting a good job acquiring wealth and influence, status, prestige, and so forth. But have we missed out on anything in this great effulgence of looking outwards and acquiring and consuming? And the ideal now of 8 billion people, the good life is one in, in which our gross domestic product is ever increasing, because this was going to turn out really well. 
And increasing wealth will make you happier. Increasing prestige and power will make everybody happier until we're, we are all the Bill Gates and the Elon Musk of the world and we'll all be so incredibly happy, except for this is sheer psychosis to believe that. And it isn't that still the message that we're telling our young, children, our young people. Get a good education here. Go to Oxford, Cambridge, go to MIT, go to Harvard, and you'll get the good life. Have we missed out on anything? This extraordinary expanse of knowledge, technology, power, influence, status, prestige. Have we missed out on anything? How about the most intimate reality there is, of which we can be, and we are, indubitably aware? Nobody in his right mind can deny this one reality. We are conscious. We are conscious. We are sentient. We're not only conscious, but we feel, we yearn, we fear, we hope. What is this consciousness? This most intimate of all realities, of all natural phenomena, I want to emphasize that, of all natural phenomena. What is more in intimate in a way, therefore, what is more knowable than our own consciousness? What is more knowable than our own minds? your thoughts, your emotions, your hopes, fears, your memories, your dreams. What is more knowable than that? Isn't it the case? Whether we can really know the nature of reality out there, independent of all appearances, independent of subjective experience, as we'll see right towards the end of this presentation, that's definitely been called into question by modern physics. No, nothing new age here. I like new age from a distance. <laughs> but I'm not new age, I'm now age. <laughs> and that's where we all are. We're all now age. I know it rankled from the time I first went to India when people of my skin color would say, modern society, modern society, as if Eurocentric civilizations have a monopoly. Whereas the Tibetans living in Tibet before the Chinese invasion, oh, well, they were not modern society. They, they, they didn't get into the current, they got left out. And so they're there with, with no electricity, and their highest technology was a prayer wheel and bridges and mills to, to grind their barley. That was cutting-edge technology for the last 1,000, 1,500 years into that. Isn't it a shame? So primitive. So primitive. And yet when I went to live with Tibetan refugees in 1971, from a very privileged life, I encountered the happiest people I'd ever met in a refugee community. The warmest hearts, the kindness, the openness, the cheerfulness. I'd never met, and there's a refugee community, McLeod Gunj. That was a wake up call. What's been left out? What have we missed? The science of the mind began in the late 19th century with great pioneers like William James and Wilhelm Wundt in Germany, Edward Titchener in New York, but it came from England. The scientific study of the mind, it took 300 years from the time of Galileo, the father of modern science, 300 years before the scientists got around to the mind. That with which they had been pursuing their scientific knowledge for 300 years, they had never paused to think, well, should we actually examine the tool that we've been using to explore the external world? Might we want to look at the tool itself to see whether it's always giving us accurate information, whether our own perceptions are reliable, whether our logic is reliable. 300 years before the science of the mind even began. And it began with these great pioneers like William James, which have tremendous respect. And William James, made a plea that the science of the mind may be a natural science, that we may treat the mind and emotions, memories, cognition, perceptions, dreams as natural phenomena. And like every other branch of science, from the time of Galileo, like every other branch of science, the cutting edge research tool, mode of inquiry, is to directly observe with all the rigor and sophistication depth and profundity you can observe the phenomena you're trying to understand. That's what separated Galileo from Copernicus, brilliant mathematician, not much as an astronomer. I don't even ever looked at the stars. 
He did a very good, very good mathematician. But Galileo found the right technology for the celestial phenomena. It's called a little gadget called telescope. He found the right technology. Before that, it was just a debate. It was a matter of opinion. Earth in the center, sun in the center. It's a matter of opinion. They debated. The theologians debated back and forth. Nobody winning. One week of observing Venus with his little telescope. And he saw that Venus has phases. Well, it can't have phases if the Earth is in the center. He proved in one week something had been debated since that time of Aristarchus, Ptolemy, Copernicus, and so on. This most intimate, most accessible of all natural phenomena about this, modern science has left us in the dark. Because very shortly after this first generation of the so-called introspectionists, people like William James and the other two scientists that I mentioned, some other force came in and just like a, like a, like a train that's on one track and then it bumped over to another track. Those who had a religious-like allegiance to the metaphysical view of reality that everything boils down to the physical and the emergent properties of the physical. It's called physicalism. It's called scientific materialism. Self-congratulatingly, it's called naturalism, as if there is something natural about taking a humanly constructed category of the physical and saying, hello, reality, you all fit in this box. We human beings divide it, by the way. In fact, we've redefined it over the years from Galileo to, to Einstein to black holes and dark matter and dark energy. We've redefined physical, so it's almost evaporated into nothing by now. But the physicists came in with the behaviors to start with and said, looking inwards, but that's not scientific. If you're going to be scientific about this, you have to do what we've been doing for the last 300 years. You have to look outwards to the physical, the objective, the quantifiable, that science. Looking inwards and looking at these ephemeral, insubstantial, intangible, highly problematic, subjective states, this is just not a scientific way of doing things. And we should stop right now. And let's not even talk about subjective experience because that's not scientific either. And consciousness, my old dear friend who's passed away, Francisco Varela, world-class neuroscientist, this is back in the 1990s. He said, we neuroscientists, we don't even mention the C word <laughs> except over coffee. <laughs> but in the laboratory, we don't even talk about it because it's just a taboo. It's unspeakable because we don't have a clue how to address it. And so let's just pretend, let's sweep it under the rug and get back to neurons and photons and science. So where has this left us with no scientific definition of consciousness? How can you study something if you can't even define it? They can't, there is no conceptual definition of consciousness. Not even, they're not even close. And this is after 150 years of scientific inquiry and nature of mind where consciousness is largely ignored until very recently, as we know right in this university here. No objective means of detecting consciousness or any mental phenomenon. Your doctor does, if you say, doctor, I have a real pain in my knee, the doctor has no way of telling whether you're telling, knowing whether you're telling the truth or not. Because there is no objective measure of your knee that can show whether there's any pain there or not. So are you lying? Are you telling the truth? Are you confused? Are you just imagining you have pain, but you don't really? No scientific way of answering that question. What are the neural correlates of consciousness? Well, this is said to be, hypothetically, the minimal amount of neuronal activity necessary to generate consciousness. But that's, of course, assuming the unquestioned, and that is neurons are generating consciousness. Well, they don't, they've never found them. But that doesn't prevent them from being real believers. Consciousness is a natural phenomenon like an electron, like a galaxy, like DNA. What are the necessary causing additions for consciousness to emerge as a natural phenomenon? Not a clue. When does a human embryo become conscious? When something maybe like 3.5 billion years ago did the first organic creatures become conscious? Not a clue. And if the brain generates consciousness, how does it do that? How does the brain even influence conscious states. If you drink alcohol, why does that influence your subjective state? Why? And then with that little nasty little critter called the placebo effect, how is it that our hopes, fears, anticipation, expectation can influence the brain and other parts of the body? And the answer to all of this is 
Not a clue. <laughs> so how could we know about what happened 3.8 billion years ago in the evolution of the consciousness? Five billion years ago when our solar system came into existence, how would we know more about the nucleus of an atom than we do about the most accessible of all natural phenomena? I am conscious. And nobody can possibly persuade me, or you, hopefully, that that is true. William James, I'll just read it. He speaks so eloquently, I, I hesitate always to paraphrase him. He's writing about 120 years ago. But see for yourself if this is not true today. At present, psychology is in the condition of physics before Galileo and the laws of motion of chemistry before Lavoisier and the notion that mass is preserved in all reactions. The Galileo and the Lavoisier of psychology will be famous men. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Indeed, when they come, as come they, they someday surely will, or past successes are no index to the future. When they do come, however, the necessities of the case will make them metaphysical. They'll look like flakes. Oh, you've drifted away from science. You've gone into metaphysics. Uh, there's the door, but have a nice day. Meanwhile, the best way in which we can facilitate their advent, welcome them in, is to understand how great the darkness is, is the darkness in which we grope and never to forget that the natural science assumptions with which we started are provisional and revisable things. So my very deep admiration, I've read him quite extensively, William James, is because among, among the great intellectual giants of Eurocentric civilization, he's one of the least dogmatic of any that I've encountered. He was not a religious man, and yet he wanted one of the great classics of religious experience. He was a psychologist, he was a philosopher, a brilliant speaker. So homage to William James. What about this pesky mind-body relationship? How does the body influence the mind and vice versa? Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, great advocate of scientific materialism, profoundly skeptical, if not scathingly contemptuous of religion. But when it came to consciousness, he paused. And he said, I have, how can I get rid of that? I have a little, maybe I can get rid of it. I have, I have somebody's. Press the whole, um, Kate Reed, Kate Reed, you're a little pesky critter right here. <laughs> I, I say, tongue it, I can get rid of that little name. She's not doing anything at all. My apologies. There we go. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. I'm glad to meet you, Kate Reed. <laughs> <laughs> you too, sir. You too. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Thomas Huxley, hardcore, hardcore scientist. But when it came to consciousness, he says, how is it that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous tissue, we call stimulating electrical stimulation of neurons. That is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the jinn when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. And I think he's saying, if you really believe that the physical brain generates non-physical consciousness, and all the indica indicators are that consciousness is not physical, then you're, you believe in magic. And I've studied physics fairly extensively, and there is no branch of physics regarding anything physical in the entire universe where a physicist will say, oh, here's a physical phenomenon, but it gives rise to non-physical phenomena. There is not one instance. And yet this is a belief that goes almost unquestioned in the modern mind sciences. If you make an exceptional claim, and that is an exceptional claim, it should be backed up with exceptional experience or evidence, and that just ain't so. The contemporary neuroscientist, I've met him, very, very smart guy, University of California, why not? Donald Hoffman, he writes now, Huxley knew that brain activity and conscious experiences are correlated, but he didn't know why, he didn't know how. To the science of his day, it was a mystery. And in the years since Huxley, science has learned a lot about brain activity, but the relationship between brain activity and conscious experience is still a mystery. Just recently I heard of two, it was David Chalmers and another scientist were asked and what progress has been made about solving the hard problem, the actual nature of mind-body interactions. And there was this deafening silence because there's been no progress at all. There is a reason for that. It ain't what you do know that's a, it ain't what you do know that's a problem, not that that's a problem, it's what you don't know 
<laughs> no, it ain't what you don't know that is a problem, and it's what you do know, but just ain't so. Mark Twain. It's the the problem of, of believing you know something you don't. The greatest obstacle to the science of discovery ever since there's been science is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. And by and large, reading Scientific American, the major media, nature, science, and so on, the most prestigious journals, you'll see the article of faith that the mind, consciousness, are epiphenomena, the emergent properties of the brain, that's an article of faith that is questioned about as often as the existence of God is questioned in the Vatican. You don't even go there. Maybe it's time to go there. Okay, I've gotten blocked again. Just press the text on your end. Oh, that's right, that's right, good. Oh. In Tibetan, we have no technology at all. <laughs> mental health. Now, everyone on the planet, all 8 billion of us, all of us need to be concerned with mental health because we really don't like it when we're ill. Between physical pain and mental pain, I think you would agree. You want to be free of mental pain even more than physical. We want to be free of both, but if you had to choose mental distress, what do we know about the real causes of mental distress, mental disease? Depression right now, the number one cause of disability worldwide, not cancer, not heart disease, is depression. It's the costliest if you want to take a really financial approach to it. And it's not decreasing. I read a quote just recently from Thomas Insel, the recent, or the late, not late, but the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States. It might have been you who sent it to me. Was it $20 billion he allocated for neuroscientific research into the underpinnings, the source of depression? And he said, after allocating 20 billion, that's US, he said it was money pissed away. <laughs> $20 million could he just flush it down the toilet because something just came up in the news a couple ago within the last year. Oh, it's been found that the brain has very little to do with depression. $20 billion later, and that's just one director of one institute, let alone Great Britain and so forth and so on. Its risk is 32% higher in wealthy countries, the victors. To the victors goes the spoils of massive depression. <laughs> What's the suicide rate in among young people in New Zealand. Because they're suffering, because they're impoverished, they don't have good education, no infrastructure, no good hospitals, an ugly place to live, bad government, is that the reason? We know none of the above. This is one of the most admirable countries in the whole world. That's why I was happy to emigrate here when I was 19. Didn't get the chance. And going back to my birthday, 1950, the gross domestic product has increased 50 times since 1950, while the change in well-being has been zero. Depression has increased 10 times. That's just taking one. How about general anxiety disorder? How about PTSD? How about ADHD? And how about all of the other array of what are called mental diseases, but looking at this from a, a Buddhist perspective, these are not mental diseases. That's the problem. We're conflating the symptoms with the disease, treating the symptoms with drugs, and saying we have drugs that can manage 80% of depression cases, but all you're doing is treating, muffling, stifling, sweeping under the rug, the symptoms of the actual mental diseases. Why is this not be widely noticed? It's so obvious. It's like having a whole discipline of physical medicine where your only medications are forms of anesthesia. You have a broken bone, this will make the pain go away. You have terminal cancer, this will make the pain go away. Anesthesia, that's all the psycho, psycho so pharmaceutical drugs are. They're all forms of anesthesia. That I've checked with mental health care professionals around the world on multiple occasions, asking, is there one psychopharmaceutical drug that cures a single mental disease? And the answer is uniformly, not even one. And yet that's the primary intervention for many people suffering from mental disease. So we're facing a crisis, and this is just all old news, but the fact that we're doing so little, and we're doing too little too late, suggests that to avert these very well-known crises, 
tracing back to the rise of colonialism, it goes back to the 16th century, the Industrial Revolution from the 18th century and then burgeoning in the 19th century, the rise of capitalism, rise of communism. Marx, Marx wrote his Das Kapital in the British Museum in London. Consumerism from mid 19th century, we from this time, from mid 19th century, unprecedentedly disrupting the equilibrium of the ecosphere and we know the consequences, so I won't give any lecture on that. But I am suggesting a deeper cure, not just treating symptoms, to avert the catastrophes that we are bequeathing to our younger generations. My parents have, my generation has, right down to the 14-year-olds. We must shift, I believe, it's very clear, the problems are deep, the solutions can't be shallow. A bit more technology here, a bit more electric cars here, a bit of solar there, all good too little, too late. They're not even meeting that, that temperature ideal, 1.5, right? And so we must shift our view of ourselves and reality as a whole, re-examine our values, and redirect our way of life. Worldview, priorities, and way of life, a triad, all inextricably, inextricably related. Eurocentric civilization is really at the root of these unprecedented crises that humanity has created for itself. It doesn't count up China. Definitely not of India, not out of the Maori culture, not out of the Mayan culture or any other culture. We really, we need to look within. It's Eurocentric civilization, education, worldview, the worldview of materialism, the set of values of hedonism, the way of life of consumerism that is undermining the whole of human civilization. If you go to Google and say, what was the first university established in the world? I can tell you, I've done it. University of Bologna, 11th century of the Common Era. Congratulations, Bologna. Except for that's not even remotely true. Google is written by the victors. White people. How about this one? Having lived in India for about six years and gone there to sit at the feet of the great sages, primarily of Tibet, Bhutan, Mongolia, and so forth, but also down to Sri Lanka, studying under Indian teachers. There was this, and I won't read all of this, but you can see there's a lot of data there. This is a whole university system, a network of universities all over India, tracing back at least 500 years before the Common Era, perhaps even a thousand years before. And you can see, these were all inspired by Theravada Buddhism, Mayana Buddhism, the Vedic tradition, the Jaina tradition, the Sikh tradition, and so forth, like all of the great universities of Europe. They all were supported or nested within religion. All of them were. In the early days, all of them in America also. They're all nested, but that doesn't mean they're all theological seminaries, but they had an embracing worldview of what's the context in which they offered their education. The same was true. These are not theological seminaries. These are not monasteries. These are universities. And one can say the crown jewel of them is Nalanda. You can see Nalanda, about 700 years older than almost all the universities nowadays of Eurocentric civilization. The Nalanda tradition, Nalanda tradition, quite possibly the first international university with a, with a faculty of 1,000, a student body of 10,000, and drawing students from all over Asia, from Tibet, from Japan, from Korea, China, the Near East, coming here with a 10 to one student to teacher ratio. And for the, and that was the crown jewel of them all. Therefore, we can refer to all of this as the Nalander tradition, like in, in England, Great Britain, Oxbridge. Okay, there's the crown jewel, Oxford and Cambridge, right? Then you covered everybody else because they are the eagles flying above all. But what we, so this is virtually not known, even by many Indians it's not known. But these all rose and fell before the advent of the first year of European university. And what were they focusing on? Developing better technology, learning about the stars, DNA, and so forth? Nothing of that. Their primary focus was understanding the mind. For a thousand years, the greatest intellectuals, <laughs> the greatest academics, the most brilliant people in India, primarily in the centerpiece of their whole education system was the Adyatma Vidya, the inner knowledge, the nature of the mind, the true causes, sources of mental distress, the true sources of mental well-being, nature of consciousness, where does the mind come from? 
Where is it located? Does it have a location? What happens to the mind when you fall deep asleep and for a while you're mindless? What happens when you go into the big deep sleep of death? Does your mind just evaporate? That's merely a belief. It's merely a belief with no evidence at all. So often those who embrace the materialist worldview, they like to speak of the believers and the non-believers. And the non-believers are the realistic ones, right? I beg your pardon. Let's just kind of turn that on its head. All those who believe the mind is generated from the sperm and the egg, from complex configurations of electricity and, gen and matter in the womb, you're a believer because you got no evidence. All of you who believe that the mind just simply terminates, goes poof, the genie has just evaporated. You're a believer. You got no evidence. This is not only belief, it's blind belief. And then there are contemplative traditions of the world going back for thousands of years who've made rigorous, replicated discoveries about the origins, the nature, what happened of the mind, what happens to the mind at death. They're not believers. They've actually looked in the right place with the appropriate technology and they've made discoveries. When I think of what happened in this glorious rise, because you know, I'm European, I'm proud of our culture. We've accomplished so much. But it was really like the sun of the West rising from the West and eclipsing the moon of the East. And all you see is the sunshine. It looks like the moon has disappeared. And that's what happened. The moon of Indian civilization was eclipsed by the great British Raj. Snuffed out. Obliterated. Treated as awful. Nothing there worthy of consideration, except maybe by anthropologists. Buddhist contemplative science. In Buddhism, they didn't bring two traditions together and try to somehow unify them, join them, make them good bed partners. Buddhism has been a contemplative science from the beginning. Science as in knowledge, contemplative as in the means of acquiring knowledge, not looking outwards with technology, with mathematics. And I've studied physics extensively. It's a brilliant, brilliant approach. If what's most important to you is understanding the external world and dominating it and subjugating it and taming it and anthropomorphizing it. But if what you're fundamentally concerned with is what all sentient beings are concerned with, all sentient beings, is we don't want to suffer. The Europeans who fled from Europe because of overpopulation and poverty and so forth, why did they go to America? Why did they come way down here, down under? They didn't want to suffer. They wanted at least to suffer less. And maybe think you come to New Zealand, this incredibly beautiful land, that they could actually find some happiness. Why do we do anything at all? Religiously, scientifically, technologically, anything. Why do we get an education? Because we want to suffer less and that we can find happiness, especially something sustainable, not just a little glimpse here, a little high there, a little spasm of joy there. Isn't that what we sentient beings have been wanting for all along, is to be free of suffering. We'd like it to be free of both, but the body is very vulnerable. But why is the mind vulnerable? I can't even see your mind. Nobody can see your mind. How can anybody harm your mind? You can't even see it. Should I go to your shoulder, your heart, your frontal cortex? How do I get to your mind? I can't even see it. It's invisible. How can people's feelings be so hurt? People even don't even know where they are. These truth seekers, that's what Gautama was. He was not looking for religion. He wasn't religious. That's a Western term. He was looking for freedom, the kind of freedom that all sentient beings are seeking every day, every moment, even in our dreams. Nobody wants a nightmare more than a pleasant dream. They were truth seekers. And he worked with a premise to quote Jesus himself. The truth shall make you free. Not just faith, not just obedience, not just allegiance, not simply having the right set of beliefs, but knowing reality as it is, this crazy idea that perhaps the way to freedom could come by knowing reality as it is. And the underlying premise there is maybe we are so vulnerable to suffering, especially mental suffering, because we don't not only don't know the nature of reality, but we're getting it wrong. So he, born in India, when he left his palace, much more glamorous than my background, a prince, the crown prince, and left everything for nothing, 
become a homeless beggar as an act, a voluntary act. The first thing he did as a very, very bright young man, 29 years old, he sought out the best guidance that was available, and that was great masters of samadhi. The mind that is highly, highly honed, tuned, concentrated, empowered. <coughs> as an analogy, taking, taking our own minds or ordinary minds, as in Britain they call it a torch, in America flashlight, New Zealand. Torch, flashlight? Torch. torch, there we go. Good Brits. <laughs> we Americans were revolutionaries in so many ways. Not a torch, not a torch. That's one of those. This is a flashlight. <laughs> taking a flashlight and turning it into a laser. Ever tried to do surgery with a flashlight? Can you take this natural power, this force, natural force of consciousness, and turn it from a flashlight into a laser to make holograms, to make weapons, to do surgery, to have a cell phone, light technology? We have mastered light, nice, light technology in Eurocentric, and we just still don't even know how to define consciousness. And in terms of developing samadhi, we made basically no progress at all for all of the rise of modern science. William James wrote brilliantly about attention, but he said, we have no idea how to train it. If we could, it would be fantastic. But being in Victorian New England in the late 19th century, he never thought to go to India. And so Gautama, sought out two great masters of samadhi, accomplished, he was a prodigy, he was brilliant, that's why we remember him to today. And he found the technology, he adopted it, appropriated it, but saw it was not an end in itself, simply to develop the bliss, the equanimity, the spaciousness of samadhi, a deep, profound peace. But he took samadhi and turned it into technology. Before Galileo, a telescope was, uh, was a toy in, in the Netherlands, it was just for fun. And Galileo turned that into an instrument of technology from Galileo's three-power telescope to the James Webb Space Telescope in, what, 400 years. The telescope of the mind is samadhi, and it's called shamatha, a particular training method of developing it, the technology of highly focused attention, and he coupled that unprecedentedly with vipassana. Authentic vipassana is not simply mindfulness, it is an active inquiry in the nature of reality, starting from the inside out, the very nature of the mind, the very nature of the source of distress, the source of genuine well-being, and going from the inside out. And so Gautama stated, the mind that is established in equipoise, the mind that is balanced, free of perturbation, free of agitation, free of, free of ADHD, of emotional upheavals, a mind that is balanced, serene, calm, comes to know reality as it is. If you want to use a telescope to explore deep space, you better mount it very firmly, because if it's wobbling, you'll get no good data at all. And so this relationship between the contemplative technology of shamatha and the contemplative science of vipassana, that's a hallmark of Buddhist contemplative inquiry. It was unprecedented. It's influenced, I think, all of the other contemplative traditions of India. And now it's starting to reach out over the globe Contemplative discoveries, unlike modern science, which really has no ethics of its own, only recently human, you know, human subjects kind of criteria, you can't brutalize human beings, still get away with a lot with animals. Contemplative inquiry is indispensably necessarily rooted in ethics, nonviolence, benevolence. It's supported with contemplative technology of taking the faculties that we already have of attention, mindfulness, introspection, samadhi itself, and refining, developing these, like, like physical fitness gyms, except for this is mental fitness gyms, the refinement of the mind with samadhi to develop exceptional states of mental health and balance. And then finally turning this finely honed mind into an instrument of inquiry to examine experientially the origin, nature, and, con and destination of the mind inner causes of mental distress and well-being, the role of mind in the natural world, and not simply believing that the mind is utterly insignificant in the larger picture. As when I study cosmology, one technology, one, one cosmology textbook after another, and I found all of them had one thing in common. There was no mention at all of mind or consciousness in nature. It was so insignificant 
it didn't even bear a footnote that sentient beings actually become conscious. That's a belief, turns out to be a whopper. What is the meaning of existence? Or is that just an airy-fairy kind of humanities kind of question? What is the ground of being? No scientist actually knows what happened at the Big Bang and what caused it. Did it was it caused by nothing? But then why did it happen 13.8 billion years ago? What happened before it? Not a clue. Not a clue. What are the inner causes of suffering? The Buddha pointed, above all, pragmatically speaking, that we're desiring the wrong things. It's this craving, it is this yearning, I want to be happy, I know, I know, more wealth. I want to be happy, I want to be really sustainably happy, I know, greater influence, power, that will do it. I know, I know, greater st status, I want to be respected, I want to be adulated, I want to be famous, that'll make me so happy. And Shandadeva writing about 1,200 years ago, those desiring to escape from suffering hasten right toward suffering. And with the very desire for happiness, out of delusion, they destroy their own happiness as if it were an enemy. How is it that modern civilization, that includes China and India and so forth and so on, how is it that all these intelligent people, many of them, 8 point billion of them, a lot of them are really, really smart, and positions of tremendous influence. And all of these people in leadership roles in government, business, and so forth, they all want to be happy. Many of them, people who really should be in government, they want the population to be happy. The good ones, the other ones just want themselves to be happy. Okay. How come we are not succeeding? Have we made any progress since Galileo as a Eurocentric and now global civilization? Have we made any progress at all? in satisfying our innermost yearning to find happiness that is sustainable and freedom from distress and misery and anxiety, depression, that's sustainable, that you do not need to keep popping pills every day to subdue, sub, to submit the symptoms of the underlying problem and thereby not deal with it. What, are the, what, are, what kind of happiness are possibilities here? Now, the Buddha spoke to everyone. He wasn't just speaking to monks or nuns or just to yogis. People from all walks of life came to him. People who were outcasts, kings and royalty and brahmins, the, you know, the privileged classes and so forth. And he said, for those of you who are following an ordinary way of life, raising children, having a job and so forth, there is happiness as possible for you. Happiness of having enough that you don't have to worry about taking care of your children. That's happiness. Having some bounty so you can give your children birthday presents or invite guests over for a nice meal or go on vacation. Something you didn't need to do, but you have some bounty. You could give you could give away. You could be a philanthropist, at least helping, you know, the local Red Cross or what have you. There's happiness in having bounty. There's happiness in not being in debt, especially the kind of debt you can never pay off. There's real happiness in that. And then there's happiness of having a clear conscience. That knowing your existence has not been a blemish on the face of the earth. Knowing you've lived well, you've lived non-violently, you live benevolently. And whether you're rich or poor, powerful or weak, famous or unknown, you can have that well-being of a clear conscience. That's available for all of us. And then there were those who, like himself, left behind that life because something was more important than having simply a good life, as we think of it nowadays, having an authentic life. A life that is entirely oriented, like like iron findings lining up towards the magnet. A life that is entirely oriented to, to the pursuit of truth, but not just any truth. The structure of DNA, how far the sun is from the earth, and so on and so on. A lot of truths out there that don't matter a whit in terms of alleviating suffering. Most of science doesn't alleviate suffering. And science and technology are the instruments by which we've desecrated our environment. There wasn't any ethics there. Genuine well-being, eudaimonia, with the Greek called eudaimonia, a type of happiness not to be pursued but to be cultivated, not to be acquired but to be unveiled from within. First of all, starting off where we left off, the well-being arises from a clear conscience. 
knowing that in my interactions with human beings, fellow sentient beings, the environment, I have been nonviolent. I've done my very best to be nonviolent, non-injurious. And when the opportunity arises, do some good. Be benevolent, be kind, help out. That's a possibility. And then for those like scientists utterly focused on the pursuit of knowledge and their own disciplines, basically the same. The contemplatives utterly focus on the pursuit of knowledge, the cultivation of knowledge from within, developing that tool, not a better x-ray machine or particle collider or telescope or so forth, but developing the technology of extraordinarily refining your own mind. So you're exceptionally mentally, mentally well. The Olympic athletes are not just healthy. They've taken that instrument of the body and they've honed that into a tool. They keep on breaking records, if you notice that. They keep on breaking records. They've been at this for decades by now. They keep on breaking records of pushing the edge of strength, of resilience, of stamina. It's impressive. Where are our mental fitness gymnasiums for developing the full potential of the mind and alleviating, calming, healing the inner causes of distress? Where is that? Since we care more about our minds than our bodies, why haven't we picked up on that? And then the supreme well-being, the highest form of eudomania, knowing reality as it is. But not just any reality. There's an awful lot of it out there. And most of it is useless in terms of alleviating mental distress and recognizing the underlying causes of this distress and healing that. What reality is to be known? Knowing reality as it is, but what reality? My time is now up but i'm not so we've gone a little bit further i'll now go briefly but these notes are now in the public domain you can share them with anybody you can put them on the new york times splash them on the front page if you like but peace of mind you can't buy it you can be powerful wealthy and a celebrity and have not even a taste of peace of mind it can be cultivated Cultivate it by simply breathing. You're already doing that. You're already halfway there. You're already breathing. Congratulations. Now you could breathe mindfully. And you find something extraordinary. When you simply calm the mind as you breathe out and gently arouse your attention as you breathe in, like undulating waves, the breath coming in and out, the mind becomes calm, peaceful. Go deeper. A sense of well-being arises from within, not dependent on any pleasant stimuli coming from outside. And then an ambrosial dwelling, says the Buddha. A state of bliss. Whoever saw that coming, that you could just be mindfulness of breathing and find bliss coming from within with no props, nothing at all. Learning how to observe the mind, resting in the stillness of awareness and observing, like going into a wildlife refuge. And if you're a bird watcher, I used to be a bird watcher, resting in your, in your little cabin and then watching, watching the wildlife. So they don't know you're there. You're not interfering. You're not interacting, but just quietly watching the birds coming and go, and the mammals, the reptiles and so forth. And just watching the nature preserve of your mind without being ensnared by it, captured, carried away by it, observing emotions rather than feeling them, observing observing and watching the mind calm, the whole discipline there. People spend thousands of hours developing this skill. It doesn't come naturally, but the benefits are utterly awesome. Consciousness itself, why has it proved so elusive? Because it's like gazing steadfastly at the West, waiting for the sun to rise. You'll never ever see the sunrise. You'll be the last one to know because you're looking outwards. I won't say stupid. I now have not said stupid. You're looking in exactly the wrong direction. You really feel by looking at neurons and dendrites and glial cells. Wow, bonanza, we just discovered the consciousness. That was a little pesky, pesky little glial cell talking to and having a real deep conversation with this synapses. And shazam, wow, isn't, well, isn't it great we crack that nut? Except it's not a nut, it's completely nuts. So learning how to observe consciousness itself, your nearest neighbor, and fathom it by looking at it. What a crazy idea. 
but people who spend thousands and thousands of hours a day. These are professionals. And now we come back home, 21st century, back to Donald Huffman. There's no way to remove the observer, us, from the, our perception of the world. He's speaking as a mind scientist, a brain scientist. You can't do what we've assumed you can do ever since Galileo. You can't do it. It doesn't work. You can't remove the observer, us, from our perceptions of the world, which is created through our sensory processing and through the way we think and reason. Our perception, and hence the observations upon which our theories are based, is not direct, but rather is shaped by a kind of lens. We are inextricably entangled with everything we know about the world. Our view is always anthropocentric view. We can't help it. Have human brains. What are you going to do? And one of my favorite, the late Hilary Putnam, brilliant philosopher at Harvard University, studying it ext extensively. Elements of what we call language or mind penetrate so deeply into what we call reality that the very project of representing ourselves as being mappers of something language independent is fatally compromised from the very start. It's not saying the universe is dependent upon human concepts and observation, because that's just flat out silly. And this is a very, very distinguished professor at Harvard, so he's not a silly man. But our perception of reality, our understanding of reality, is absolutely entwined with language. And to think you can separate, well, here's the language part, and here's everything independent of language. Dream on. And now I go to the area where I actually have some academic training, physics. As a Buddhist monk, when I was 34, I decided Buddhism is a knowledge tradition, but it's not the only kid on the block. Not only, it's not only the only, only song being sung. sung it's, there's something called science. Let's check that out. And I decided to go for the science for which physicists like to say all the other scientists have physics envy trying to emulate physics because it was the first one. It was the one that was a trailblazer. It was Galileo, it was Newton, it was James Clerk Maxwell, it was Einstein, it was Niels Bohr, it was Heisenberg. They are the trailblazers to fathoming the actual nature of reality from a scientific perspective. Physicist Andre Linda, very eminent physicist at Stanford University, said without introducing an observer, we have a dead universe which does not evolve in time. And this re-emphasizes the role of the participant in the self-observing universe of quantum cosmology. The universe becomes live, time-dependent, only when one divides it into two parts, the subjective observer and the rest of the objective universe, and the wave function of the rest of the objective universe depends on the time measured by the observer. In other words, the evolution of the universe and everything in it, including life itself, is possible only with respect to the observer. We finally invited ourselves back into the universe. Not by something airy fairy or new age or flim flam. One of the most eminent physicists is alive. And a man I know personally doing cutting edge research in quantum mechanics, University of Massachusetts, Christopher Fuchs, is not that the world is built up from stuff on the outside, as the Greeks would have it, nor is it built up from stuff on the inside, as the idealists like George Barclay and Eddington would have it. Rather, the stuff of the world is in the character of what each of us encounters every living moment, stuff that is neither inside nor outside, but prior to the very notion of a cut between the two. A physicist saying dualistic grasping, an objective world out there and the subjective in here, is one of those problems of an illusion of knowledge. You think you know what you're talking about but in fact, you got it all wrong. Is there a deeper dimension? I won't read the whole quote, time is really over and I have to be respectful of time, even if it doesn't exist. <laughs> is there a yet deeper dimension beyond the continuum of consciousness, the contemplatives around the world, in all of those six that I mentioned? Contemplatives in all of the six, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, contemplatives in all of these six traditions with their wildly diverse worldviews have all come to the experiential conclusion consciousness doesn't originate in the womb and it doesn't end at death. Deal with it. There are people who know and there are people who believe. These are the knowers, the rest are believers. This is something beyond that and again in contemplative traditions of the world. All of them without exception say, yeah, there's something beyond that a deeper dimension of consciousness, called the Tao, called the Atman, called the Holy Spirit, called Buddha Nature, called Nirvana, called Brahman, called God. It is real. It is real 
They cast all other reality into Shadowland. Knowable, but only by itself, not as one more accumulated piece of knowledge that you put into your satchel. Oh, now I know this too. Primordial consciousness, the knowing of which frees. So now I finally, only seven minutes old, so I hope that I can be forgiven. William James, you come back to William James. As a great empiricist, an anti-dogmatist of any kind, let empiricism once become associated with religion as hitherto through some strange misunderstanding. It's been associated with irreligion, and I believe that a new era of religion as well as philosophy will be ready to begin. And I fully believe that such an empiricism is a more natural ally than dialectics ever were or can be of the religious life. Such a science of religions where experience is central can offer mediation between different believers and help to bring about consensus of opinion. And finally, the final note, he has the last word. Even the personally non-religious might accept its conclusions, the conclusions of contemplative science. On trust, much as blind persons now accept the facts of optics, it might appear as foolish to refuse them. So that's my lifetime's work, the last 50 years in a nutshell, which I offer to you, hopefully it's a little bit helpful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, an absolutely enlightening and wonderful presentation. So um, the floor is now open for other questions that you can you may want to ask. Thank you. Questions, or I was trained for years as a monk in the Galupa tradition that we're spending five hours a day debating. So if you'd like to debate, I'm up for it. Yeah. <laughs> or questions or responses, insights of your own. This is some time for us to sit together and share. Yes, please. What can we say about the existence, the existence of reality prior to The question is based on the assumption that there was reality before there was mind to comp contemplate. As I mentioned before, I was, I was studying cosmology as a Buddhist monk. I was a monk for 14 years. And so as a Buddhist monk at Amherst College, I'm making my own little hermitage there in the college, and I was studying cosmology. And consciousness never comes up. So we assume from material, materialistic, which is very sensible in a way, the story. We, we have a story that many of us are very familiar with. It started 13.8 8 billion years ago, and then 5 billion years ago, our planet, 3.5 billion years ago, conscious organisms, and then voila, here we are. Um, but that does assume that consciousness at some point or mind emerged from matter, which actually makes no sense at all, because there's no branch of physics that says, oh yeah, that's possible. And so what do we know about the universe prior to any mind that is there to contemplate it? Nothing at all. And there's a statement that I know from Heisenberg and the Heisenberg in quantum mechanics, but which I learned many years earlier from Lama Kirti, in about the fifth century, I believe, correct? I'm speaking of my fact checker here, that let us not attribute existence to that which is unknowable in principle. So then Heisenberg was speaking about what's the nature of external reality? You know, they were talking about particles. What's the nature of electrons, photons, all of the other elementary particles prior to and independent of the act of measurement? Now, that's a good scientific question. Prior to and independent of the act of measurement. Now, measurement problem, you may know, is quite complicated and unresolved. But he said that question is asking a question about something that is unknowable in principle. Because you can't know anything about anything without making some kind of a measurement whether it's with technology or looking or listening, but prior to any active measurement of observation, you're asking what's there prior to, and that's unknowable in principle. And therefore, if something is unknowable in principle, there's no reason to say it exists. Because it's unknowable in principle. So it's adjoining, this goes back to the fifth century, fourth century in Indian epistemology, of this complete integration of ontology and epistemology. Ontology is what's there what exists, and epistemology, how do we know? So for a long time in modern science, of course, modern science until, until Darwin 
was entirely biblically based. It's sometimes called Christian science, except for that term has been taken over by denomination. Galileo was a very, very devout Roman Catholic. Copernicus was a churchman, worked for the church. Kepler was a theologian. Newton was a theologian. James Clerk Maxwell, a very devout evangelical Christian. The whole of the scientific world is couched within the biblical narrative that some time ago, whether 8,000 years ago or 13 point, or 3.5 billion years ago, God created and it was done and God knew what was there. So Galileo, like so many of his peers and later, seeking a God's eye view of reality was the answer to your question, what did God see before we were here to see? And then God was taken out of the equation with the rise of secularism, with Darwin and Huxley and so on. And then the, the philosopher Thomas Nagel said, it's no longer a God's eye perspective we're looking for, but a view from nowhere. A view from nowhere. Take God out of the equation. And so they never found it. They never found it in physics. But it's not only a not finding, but the cutting edge theoretical physics, for example, from oh, two of the, the brightest lights at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, saying we're now fundamentally calling into question the very existence of space and time. It's not objectively real. And I have detailed quotes. I thought I can't have any, I have, have any more slides here. But the very notion that space and time are out there objectively real, waiting for something to be put into it, and then waiting for somebody to know about it, the very existence of the stage for the play, said one of the most premier theoretical physics, physicists alive, that space and time don't exist. They're not in the fabric of reality. And they said, this poses a real problem to physics. Because now what on earth are we studying? <laughs> Is physics now a branch of psychology? <laughs> and if so, that would be a huge disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> so, ongoing question. Go, absolutely. <clears throat> so you had said quite early in your talk that science is slowly creeping into the darkness, but the darkness goes on immensely far. I didn't know those, those exact words, but I mean, we're mm -hmm. beginning to understand more and more, but as we understand more and more, we realize there's an enormous amount we don't understand yet, and that's mm -hmm. in the outward looking science. Right. And some people, myself included, think that we were recently involved, semi smart monkeys, yeah. looking at a almost inherently complex universe. Mm -hmm. So if we accept our limits as we're looking outward, mm -hmm. then why, if we turn inward, and with the wisdom that man has uncovered inwardly, yeah. would we make any conclusion that we're near the end of that understanding? Your opening comment reminds me of a statement made by a very dear and respected colleague of mine, Marcelo Gleiser. Outstanding physicist. You didn't know it from that. Uh, he's at Dartmouth University. Very, very fine physicist, an, astro an astrophysicist. And he's also knows how to write popularly. He does wonderful books. And one of them is the island, the island of knowledge. And that is the greater the island grows, the greater the borders of the unknown. The more we know, the more we learn about how much we don't know. And so I quote him with great respect. We're seeing the very existence of space and time being called seriously into question. Nima Akati Khamed was an Iranian, Canadian, American physicist at the Institute of Advanced Study. That's like being born in heaven in academia as a physicist, and he's there. And the director of the whole institute himself, they're speaking in the same, they're singing, singing a duet. Space and time are gone. Space and time are gone. And if that's gone, then exactly where are these borders? Because you assume space and time is there and there's a world there that populates space and time, except for the stage is gone. And so it raises deeper questions than the expanding island. And if, that's, if there's no ocean, what are you expanding into? When it comes to the mind, I really am very much a William James at heart. I'm a Buddhist, very happy, very content to be a Buddhist. I found my home in Buddhism, never converted to it. But in terms of a moderner who I can really embrace his ideals, radical empiricism. And so I've taken that approach when it comes to science and in my studies of physics. I was always saying, well, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? And came, came out with tremendous appreciation and respect for what I've been studying. When it comes to the truth claims by contemplatives, 
and I'll just focus on one tradition that I know more about than others, because it's 50 years now of immersing myself in it, the Buddhist contemplative tradition. The Buddha himself said of his own teaching, said, this is what I've discovered, this is what I've seen. This is a reality of suffering that's much worse than you ever imagined. Here's a reality of suffering that's much closer than you ever imagined. Here's a reality of freedom you never even imagined, but it is real because I know it. And here's a path to such freedom, and I know that as well. This is what I've discovered, and here are a lot of the other things I've discovered along the way. But he said, do not accept my words out of authority. Do not accept my words out of faith. Do not do so. I do not encourage you. I discourage you from accepting them simply because I said so. But rather like a goldsmith takes something that somebody says, this is gold, and I want $5,000 for it. Well, you're not going to say, oh, sure, well, here's $5,000. You're going to test it, and you're going to melt it, and you're going to cut it, and you're going to rub it. And so with all your expertise, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is solid gold. How much did you want? 5000 Okay, that's a good price. But you would test it, because that's a lot of money. And that's money. But what we are doing is investing our lives. And that's something you can't get more of. And so the Buddha said, test my teachings as if they were maybe gold. Test it for yourself. We, in the, our Western categories, Western academic category, we have the, the box of religion. And I, that's what box I went into for my PhD studies at Stanford. We have a box of philosophy and then the box with many sub-boxes of science. And we placed Buddhism in the box of religion, which at Stanford University is kind of like the garbage dump box. <laughs> There were the fuzzies and the techies. The techies were the scientists and computer science and so forth, people who were really hard nosed. And then the fuzzies. The fuzzies were the people in the humanities. And then there was the fuzziest of the fuzzies. <laughs> and I gravitated right to that. <laughs> and so I have my PhD in fuzzy, 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 fuzzy was an animal. <laughs> and so I look at these extraordinary claims. I've been looking into them 50, for 50 years about five years in solitary retreat, maybe 40,000 hours of meditation. I'm still quite an amateur, and that's not humility. But I know people who are not amateurs. So compared to a lot of people, oh, Alan, you're, you're really quite a meditator, okay, compared to you. <laughs> but I've lived with yogis who spent 35 years in solitary, meditating 16 hours a day. I've lived with professionals, and I've sat at their feet, and I've listened, and then I've taken their experiments. I mentioned three. Mindfulness, breathing, observing the mind, resting right in the very nature of consciousness itself. And I claim no deep realizations. I never do. But I can say my confidence has grown enormously. And so these claims of truth, in many traditions, they'll say, well, first of all, do you have faith? Then come right in. And Buddhism says, you already have a lot of faith, maybe too much. Why don't you start questioning the articles of faith you've never got around to questioning? Because maybe the roots of your suffering and dissatisfaction are there and not in religion or Buddhism or this industry or that political party. Maybe the roots of your unhappiness are inside. Why don't you take a look? So that's my answer to your question. That there were people at the time of Galileo that when they read his story, Messenger, 1608, I think it was published, his first discoveries, moons of Jupiter, sunspots, craters in the moon, and so forth. There were, he had two types of adversary. And one type of adversary, these were the scholastics at the university. And they said, you young upstart, you, you are questioning Aristotle? Who do you think you are, you little pipsqueak, with your little toy there? You're questioning St. Thomas Aquinas? Who do you think you are, you little piece of poop? We don't take you seriously. You're questioning the greatest, brilliant minds in all of human history. They're all European, by the way. And your question, why should we take you seriously? What do you got? Your little telescope and a few little mathematical equations? Big deal. So they threw them out that way. And the other ones were smart. They said, this telescope, this telescope, you think you're telling us about something about Jupiter and its moons and Venus and the sun. They're way out there. But you're looking at this little contraption. This, how do you know it's not a kaleidoscope? How do you know that everything you're seeing is not simply an, an artifact? of what we say nowadays, your visual cortex. How do you know these are not just illusions? God knows what's happening, but all you're seeing is through these lenses and you don't even understand how they work. So why do you place greater veracity on what you can see through this tube rather than the Bible? 
and the tradition, the scholastic tradition, the pinnacle, the crown jewel of European education, you're looking through these glasses, these, these lenses. If they're just illusions, they're not to be trusted. And so for there, they were fundamentally questioning his methodology. That was the epist that was the methodological, and the other one was the ontological. We already know reality. We're very happy, thank you very much. And take your little glimpses here and there and play with them, do whatever you like. But we get we're not taking these serious. And so I find reflections of that in the modern world as well. You yogis, it's very nice that you're sitting there meditating for 16 hours a day. But why should we believe anything you have to say about reality? If you're just basically doing an elegant version of navel, navel gazing. And why should we take seriously anything you say? And the answer is, we shouldn't. We're not asking to take anything on faith. When I studied mathematics, because I need to study mathematics, I wanted to study quantum mechanics, I had to do all the hard work. And I learned something very interesting when I was studying advanced calculus. They said, there's only one way you can learn mathematics. Not by studying its history, not by studying textbooks. There's only one way to learn mathematics. And that's by doing mathematics. And that's true. And so one can learn a lot about meditation by studying the behavior of meditators, studying brain correlates, studying verbal reports and so forth. You learn a lot about it. But the only way you can make any discoveries or check whether any so-called discoveries of meditators, contemplatives, whether they're true or false, is by meditating. So among the churchmen, I say this with great respect, when Galileo came out with his very unsettling discoveries, he said, but this is just what I saw. And here's my eight-power telescope. He, built, he got up as far as the 30-power telescope. He says, this is what I saw. But you can't refute me with logic or quoting Thomas Aquinas or... But tell him, you know, tell him, you can't refute me that this is evidence. If you want to see whether my discoveries are veridical or they're just fantasies or artifacts of my contraption, build your own telescope. So the Jesuits and the Dominicans in particular said, okay. And behold, before long, we had an observatory in the, in the Vatican. We've had for hundreds of years by now. Because they followed what the Buddha said. They didn't know it. And I'll end on this note, but I love your questions. We could have a long conversation. We already have. <laughs> but during those early days, time of the Buddha, when he was still alive, those who really committed themselves very deeply to testing for themselves his hypotheses, that he said, I know this, but you don't know. So if you want to know, develop ethics, develop your mind, develop Vipassana insight, and it transform people's lives. They were trying to work people lives. They, they just the whole way of being present in the world. And so there was one follower of his that, that he just embodied peace of mind, the way he would walk, move, everything about him was just this man has found something. His serenity here is just so tangible. And somebody came to him and said, Friend, who's your teacher? What tradition are you following? And he said, Come and see. Come and see. He didn't say come and believe, or my teacher's omniscient, he's a Buddha, you should become it. No, he just said, Come and see. That's what Galileo said. Come and see. And that's the real answer to your question. One more, maybe. Yes, please. Um, sure, I'm a psychologist. Oh. I'm engaging in mindfulness research. Fantastic. PhD, and I'm really happy and
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your comments. And this brings me back to the beginning. Because it could easily look at people just listening to everything I said for an hour or so. It could look like, okay, Alan, you basically trashed Eurocentric civilization, but you said India can save the day, so why don't we learn the East and you know, learn from these people we've been subjugating for the last 400 years. I can see why one might draw the conclusion. But I'm still white. <laughs> I'm, still Euro I'm still Eurocentric. And what I'm proposing here, with great hope actually, is not just going back and retreating, retrieving things from the past and trying to bring them into the center, but working with people like Adrindam and scientists all over the world actually, um, to do something unprecedented. Because there weren't any good old days. The kingdom in which the Buddha was born, raised, was wiped out by a neighboring kingdom, just slaughtered everybody, he lost most of his kin. Not a good day for his for his home. And they were wiped out. And that's India. Ahimsa, Ahimsa, except for when it's not. <laughs> and Tibet was no, I mean, I love Tibet. I've been there many times, lived Tibetans for many, many years. That was no, no Utopia. Yeah, they had prayer rules and so forth. They also had a lot of sectarianism and violence and bigotry. And, you know, they were problem with Tibetans as a human. You know, that's... But what I'm envisioning, which is already starting to happen, and I'm just one of many players in that, is something unprecedented. That in terms of scientific inquiry, it broadens its scope to include first person explicitly in empiricism. We don't pretend as if first person doesn't count. Because if it doesn't count, then no scientific inquiry of any kind counts, because all of it is first person, corroborated by multiple people. And then we, say, we speak of the third. But you're number one, you're number two, but number, number three is never found. You know, there is no third person. It's just a whole bunch of first persons. <clears throat> and so, of something unprecedented, because in all of those hundreds and hundreds of years of inquiry, by like Indian and Southeast Asian, Tibetan and so forth, you look at all the literature, I mean, thousands and thousands of volumes, tremendous insights of so many kinds. And what will you learn about the brain? Pretty much that it's located in the head. <laughs> they, they got that. Mm -hmm. But basically nothing at all. And so is the brain insignificant in terms of the operations of the mind? Not really. <laughs> you know? And so the brain is a player. It shouldn't simply be dominating the stage at all times. And so unprecedented is bringing in the rigor, I will say the glory, because I have a profound admiration for science. Couldn't be here without it. I wouldn't be alive now. I would have died two years ago from pneumonia and probably died just a few months ago from another problem. And it was modern science, modern medicine that saved my life. I thought I'd be dead twice. And that, that's not counting the first, first, the first time when I had hepatitis for the third time, and that was Tibetan medicine that saved my life. So now, okay, thank you, everybody. I'm still, I'm still here. And so unprecedented is an integrated, multifaceted avenue of inquiry that draws from the magnificent strengths of modern science and draws from the magnificent strengths of contemplative inquiry, where each is equally open to the other with mutual respect and appreciation and then integrated. That's unprecedented, and that's real fully-fledged contemplative science. We're not just studying scientists and not simply studying meditators as subjects and saying, oh, friends, Roman countrymen, lend us your brains, you know, but actually meeting as peers. And why I have so much respect for and appreciation for physics, I believe, is because I have studied it. I've done mathematics up to the short wave equation. I've done the hard work. And I see that when astronomers say there are exoplanets, I believe them. I don't think, well, what do you know after all? And so much knowledge, for most of us, it is knowledge based on their authority, which they well earned. 
But having years, spent years and years living with Tibetans in Asia, Sri Lanka, India, multiple times to Tibet, they've also earned in a very different way, but a comparable way, that there are, they have people there over the history of Buddhism, and let alone Hinduism, Taoism, and so forth. I never set, set them aside. But there's an enormous amount of peer review among these highly accomplished yogis, and I know especially of Tibet, even to the present day, I can start listing names, Yang Chenbeche, and the, all the Tibetan, oh yeah. Jingo Kens, oh, oh yeah. The color, oh, oh yeah. And so the great ones recognized the great ones. Einstein recognized Niels Bohr. They differed really deeply. But boy, did he know I have a, he had a worthy adversary. And they were, of course, close friends. And so the creme de la creme recognized the creme de la creme in science. And then there's those who are second tier and third tier, and they're high school teachers. But they recognize they're not Einstein's, but that we know there is something there. And likewise in the contemporary, it's very similar. So I would say, if you ask me, Alan, do you believe they're exoplanets? I say, no, I know they're exoplanets. I know they're exoplanets. I know the Earth goes around the sun. I know that. And they say, well, show me. And I said, I couldn't, but I'm relying upon people. I know they know. And therefore I know, as I know where I was born, I was there, but I didn't see any signs. I have no idea, maybe I was born in Ethiopia for all I know. But my parents are real authorities there, my mother especially. And so when she said, Alan, you were born in Pasadena, I said, okay, boss, I know I'm born in Pasadena. And so in a similar way, I would say on that level, I know many things that are not yet within my scope of knowledge, but I know I'm relying upon. I believe in DNA, but I couldn't prove it. I believe there is something called a coronavirus, but I've never seen one. And maybe they show it, Photoshop it. Photoshop it. So to just bring a parity there, with mutual respect, which is kind of unprecedented, because frankly, and I want to be again, a lot of Buddhist things, besides a bunch of Yahoo, science is love. What's it done for anybody? Have made anybody happier, not more virtuous, not less greedy and hateful and so forth and so on. So there are quite a number of Buddhists that say, I have nothing to do with science. They're more of a problem than the solution. They're all materialists. And that's a delusion. So there are closed-minded ones there, and there are closed-minded ones here, and I say, all very well, have a nice day, and then I focus on people left over. And I hope I'm one of them. Maybe final one for today. Thank you for making this great. Oh, happy to. You told me that two hours before I'm coming. Welcome. I feel so overwhelmed with everything you said, because it's like, it's like, what do we do that? And like, how do we get how do we overcome and how do we integrate this? For example, I'm a yoga teacher and it's been the most difficult thing to overcome. Government yeah. questioning if it's just yoga. And I'm yeah. like, I'm seeing it with the kids that I'm working. Yeah. Uh, I have to do my own research, but I'm sure. a yoga teacher. Yeah, sure. You know, I'm sure. just a yoga teacher. I'm never that uni. So mm -hmm. I can hear it and I'm just like, I have to collaborate with a psychologist because on my own, I'm not good enough. That's right. And then everything I'm taking is like, I'm sorry, but racism is part of it. Like, I, right. I can't, you know, question what you're saying. It's like, I understand, for example, with the Indian culture. Like, that's my medicine. Like, whatever it hurts, that's how I fix it. But if I speak to some people, you know, not personal, but it's just like, it's like, I'm just with the witchcraft. And I'm like, mm -hmm. the solution. I say with enormous confidence, there's the solution. And that is there are open-minded people among psychologists, among neuroscientists, among physicists and philosophers and educators, among Buddhists and Hindus and Christian contemplatives. There are open-minded people. 
And there are many people who are not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are many people who are not open-minded. And that's okay. It's really okay. I have People have a right to be narrow-minded. They have a right to be dogmatic and closed-minded. Nobody can force them to be otherwise. Therefore, they have a right to be so. And I wish them well, but I'm not going to waste any time on them. That's not out of disrespect, but I won't have try to have a, a talk about Heidegger versus Husserl with a frog, because there's no point. So for closed-minded, whether they call themselves religious or political, scientific, or what have you, wish them well, but we can waste a lot of time there. But there are open-minded people everywhere, including right here at Christchurch, right here at University of Canterbury. So seek out the open-minded ones. And and my colleague, even Natanya and Kathy, Kathy Graham, were working on developing a network of centers for contemplative research, which is an open red carpet spreading in all directions. Come anyone with an open mind who is interested in the nature of mind, mental health, nature of consciousness, and how we can fathom the mind in order to heal the world. And so we found many, many open-minded people all over the world. And you don't need to look outside of Christchurch, you'll find plenty, plenty here at this university here. So these are research centers for contemplatives, but inviting scientists in to do exactly the kind of, how do you say, complementary, collaborative research that I've been speaking of. But also, it's, you, speak, you speak of credibility, and that is important. It's currency. If you have no credibility, you can be the most brilliant person in the world, nobody will listen to you. So then what are you going to do? I'm not looking for credibility. I'm just who I am. I say what I say. If it's true, it's true. If it's not true, it's not true. But in order to really be a benefit to society, to this modern world, that's desperately need a lot of help, to have an institutional basis can be helpful. And so I know of two recently established centers for contemplative studies in Australia, Monash University, University of Melbourne, both in Melbourne. And my colleague, Dr. Eva Natanya, she was right there. So we met with some of the movers and shakers there. She was one of the keynote speakers. And the open-minded people there, addressing deep issues about mindfulness, but not just doing the religion as a flat approach, oh, it's good for you because it's good for your brain, but actually looking deeper. And multiple perspectives coming in of open-minded people. That was crucial. And so there's one benefactor that gave 20 million here and 20 million there. Now they have these centers and they're doing groundwork, groundwork here. And so I contacted the benefactor and even I had a lunch with him just recently. And I asked him, he's an, he's an Aussie, very, very affluent. And I said, I know you really want to focus on Australia, it's your homeland. But because of very almost without parallel, a close relationship between New Zealand and Australia, might you consider funding such a center for contemplative studies here in New Zealand? He said, yeah. So I said, yeah, I'm open to that. You know, he's not out of money yet. And so it does take money to start something like this. But when you have an institutional basis in a very credible, esteemed university, like here, and I'll be going to the University of Otago later during this tour, very reputable universities, you know, good, solid, respectable. And if you couch within that, revolutionary types of innovations, of collaboration, of insight, open-mindedness, students will come. Because I know a lot of students are bored with the status quo. And they know the status quo is part of the problem, not the solution. So insofar as there can be more of these centers for contemplative studies, and again, by the very nature of the beast, they have to be cross-cultural and interdisciplinary. That's the way. So I think there really is. I'm not a pessimist, and I don't think I'm an optimist, but I think realistically speaking, there's so much goodwill in the world, in academia, in government, and elsewhere that there is a way for us to make our way through this thicket that we've created for ourselves. But it will need institutional bases as well. We can't just sit, step aside and say, well, you're a bunch of fuddy-duddies, closed-minded, you're part of relic, the relics of the past. Well, that's just not true. The university is still on the cutting edge of many branches of science, and this could be one of them, contemplative science. And so here's the man. <laughs> well, thank you. Respected colleague. Thank you very much. Thank you. One last question. Yes. I have a simple question to ask. In terms of the mind and consciousness, like from your past experience, especially the time spent in Tibetan, how do you um, connect to a higher consciousness at a deeper level? Say, say another way, how do you 
talk to your heart of yourself. How do you do that? I think that is a very important question. It certainly is a very important question. The time is very late, so I have to give a very concise answer. If one meets someone you don't know, but you feel may have profound wisdom to share with you, right? a little possibility, I think this person may be a real sage, could really have solutions. The first thing to do maybe would be to stop talking and to listen. And so when we go into the minds, often we're going in with a microphone at our lips and we're talking our way, we're talking our way through thinking and thinking and analyzing, remembering and figuring out and talking and talking and drowning out a deeper wisdom that is there. But it's a wisdom that comes from silence and not from chatter. So this is why we have practices like mindfulness of breathing and so on. To develop this inner stillness. That we can listen inwardly and see voices of wisdom coming from within. But for that, we have to button up and listen very carefully. The, the person behind you just gave a whole one-day seminar and a keynote lecture on that topic, so you might want to connect with her. Still listen to you. Hey, thank you very much for your participation and questions. Certainly, to uh, bring this line into the but this conversation will continue. I will share the uh, video and uh, the other resources with you all, and um, we'll try to see if we can build together a community. These questions and concerns, you know, even hope of developing a conversation.